We read in these seven churches the, this amazing uh, exhortation or call to, to, to awaken our ears. He who has an ear. Do you have one? Yes. No, you have two. Yes, that's better. So you can listen better. Let them hear what the Spirit says. Does the Spirit speak today? Yes. yes, he does. And to who is he speaking? To the churches, to us. He is speaking to us. This book is written for us. You know, many theologians of the past, they deny this book. They don't recognize its uh, importance and, and everything. Even great people, you would be surprised. They, they think this is only like a, a symbolism and all of this, like a nonsense or whatever, like not really useful. You know, there are different schools of interpretation uh, for the book of uh, Revelation. We'll look at it a bit later. But this is written, the, the, the voice like a trumpet, commanded right to these seven churches. So John didn't make it up. Okay, I have nothing to do today. I'm in my cave, in my prison. I have nothing to do, so maybe give me a pen and a piece of paper, and I, I'll write whatever comes to my mind. That is not how this book has been written. This is amazing, a series of visions. It's not one vision, it's one book. It, it makes a, a one revelation, but it's actually a series of uh, visions and, and uh, angels and uh, all sorts of things that God came and he commanded. And at the end of the book, he even warned not to seal, not to hide. This is not to be hidden. This is only one time in the book of Revelation. He is commanded one part, one vision, don't keep it for yourself. Don't, don't, don't share that one. It was too glorious. But this book is written for you. It's written for me. Amen? Hallelujah. Uh, I like a better amen than this one. Because this is God writing and speaking to you this morning. Okay? Are we, uh, do we agree on this? Yes. It's clear. Okay. Hallelujah. So this morning we will see how the Lord looks at His church. You know, we look at churches like we participate in the international churches of Hong Kong and we see so many different approaches. The music style, the decoration, the mood in the church, the trend of the church, whatever people, do. some are extremely traditional, some are extremely cool and trendy, and big and small ones, and you have all sorts of churches in Hong Kong and in the world as well. But how do Jesus look at a church? How does Jesus Christ look at our church? Because it has to come back to us at some point this morning also. So Jesus looks at his church and he evaluates it. We will see the concern of Jesus Christ for his church. Jesus has, has a heart for his church. I, I was, uh, the more I'm reading the book of Revelation, the more I can feel the tears and the pain and the agony of Jesus Christ to look at the mess that he is describing for most of these churches. It reminds me when you look at the Old Testament and you look at the king of Israel and the king of Judah. I, I, I see a, a, a repetition of that in, in the church also and many of the church. You know in the king of Israel they were all evil as King Ahab. Some of them in the king of Judah were good, but most of them were bad also. They did not live according to their father David, according to the model David has given to them. So a few of them, they lived up to the standards. They did what was right and pleasing in the eyes of the Lord, but most of them did not. And we look at the churches, the seven churches, how many lived according to the standards of Jesus Christ? Not many. Eh? So we have to, something to learn. So Jesus Christ has a concern. But even though the churches are not living up to their standards, He is still concerned. He has a word for each one of them. Very, very unique, very personal, showing them that He knows that He is there and that He has a solution for them, that He has something that He, he wants them to change so that He can re redeem, that He can bring them back, so that he, they all can enjoy the glory of God. You know the, the verse that we, we quote many times in Ephesians chapter 5, and we, we I don't have it on the, the scriptures, I'm just uh, quoting it. You know, Jesus Christ loved the church so much that he gave his own life 
to redeem. Uh -huh. He gave his life. That's a sacrificial love. And he cleansed it by the washing of the water and all of this. For what reason? So that he might present the church to himself. How? A bit like we sang this morning, the wonderful song we sang, and splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such things, so that she might be holy and without blemish. That is the purpose. That's the goal. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing. Uh, this is God in the church bringing the church, the bride of Christ, to be holy without blemish, no spots, no wrinkle. You know, women, they like to prepare themselves Sunday morning before they go to church. There should not be any wrinkles, you know, or whatever it is. <laughs> and this is okay, this is right. We want to be beautiful everywhere we go. And, um, but the church has to be the most beautiful because it has been cleansed, it has been redeemed, it has been, uh, you, you know, the, the touch of Jesus Christ, the redemption of Jesus Christ, uh, give a new, new life, birth. It's like you're, you're becoming younger. Huh? You look at uh, people who are in love and who are happy, they never grow old. Their eyes are always beautiful. They might not be the most beautiful person in terms of physical uh, characteristics, but when there is uh, happiness, when there is joy, peace, harmony in the house, there's always a reflection of beauty. Eh? It's true. And then the opposite is also true. When it's not happy, when there is fighting and bitterness, it's not really, really nice to look at. You want to walk on the other side of the street. <laughs> Hallelujah. So when we read uh, Revelation chapter 2 and 3, we find very shocking and interesting at the same time statement that contradicts many of the popular opinions about what a church is, <laughs> what makes church great and everything. And uh, we, we, we read things like, uh, Jesus, we will talk about it this morning. You are poor. You are, you know, just a little church out there. But, Jesus says, but you are rich. See that they're physically, they are poor. No resources, nothing. But Jesus looks at this poor church way out there that nobody cares about in the place of persecutions, in the place they are forsaken by men, despised by men. They even are slandered by men. Jesus says, but me, I see you are rich. What an encouragement it is for any single individual church anywhere in the world, on a mountain, in a valley, under the trees, anywhere it is, on the second floor, over the top of a house, anywhere it will be. Then you have another church that says, I am rich, I don't need a thing, you know, and Jesus says, you say, you are rich, but me, I say, you are poor. You are wretched, you are miserable, you have nothing, you are blind. What a contrast. One church who is actually in poverty, Jesus says, you are rich. Another one who is, I think, a great status in society, in a great position, no persecutions, whatever, popularity. And they are doing great. They are doing a lot of things. They are on the street. They play music better than anybody else. They can do everything better. And Jesus says, you are miserable. Wow. What a surprise. So that means that we have to be careful how we look at the church, how we think of ourselves or other churches, how we judge, evaluate, and everything. That's what we are going to start looking at this morning. You are poor or you are rich. On what values do we base our opinion about what makes a church great? Or how we evaluate our own church? Is Lighthouse a good church? Yes. You don't have to answer? Think maybe, maybe. Just think what, what Jesus will say so that you can have better value to, to evaluate what it is. It, when the way you look at the church your church or any other church, is that the same way that Jesus Christ looks at them? We have a PowerPoint to describe, and we, we thought about it a little bit. Uh, let's look at the, yeah, okay, seven churches, just quickly. They are in Turkey. 
all of them over there. So if you want to do a tour of Turkey, you will go there. I was trying to look at that the modern Turkey and the position of the churches, some do not have the same names. And some of them do not even exist as city anymore. They are just a ruin or they are like a museum uh, and a memory of that. And then you can uh, pay so much money and the tour guide will take you everywhere. Next, next slide. This is the revelation that John has seen when he's describing Jesus Christ at the beginning. And I want you to pay attention to the, the descriptions of his head, of his hand, of his feet. Someone like a son of man, a robe, a golden sash, his hair, his eyes, his feet, his voice, his right hand, his mouth, his face. And look at how he described it. Re the, the robe, his long robe, the golden sash is the piece of clothes here made with gold or over his chest, his hair white like wool as snow, his eyes were like blazing fire, his feet like bronze glowing in the furnace, uh, his voice was like the sound of rushing water, his right hand, he holds seven stars, the churches, it, they are in the palm of his hands. They are protected, they are provided, they are secure in his hand. Out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. You know, all of us, and many of you in the Philippines, like me, I come from Quebec and Canada, we have been raised in religious schools, and many of us come from Catholic background. And the picture that we have been, you know, constantly before us is baby Jesus. That's the picture. When you, tell you, when you hear the word Jesus, when you think of baby Jesus and, the, and his mothers, that's the Christmas story. It's good to look at the baby Jesus because it's part of one doctrine. It brings the humility of Jesus Christ. Uh, he came as a man. We look at it. But the, 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 the traditions of the church has developed this concept beyond so that if you want to go to God, don't go through Jesus go through his mother. You talk to the mother, she will talk to his son, and he will talk to God. That's Catholic. I, I, was, I, I was raised like this. You knew I'm not making it, uh, uh, making it up. That's what. So what is the most important? The mother. The mother, you go to her, you relate to the mother, you don't relate to Jesus. So what you, you are left with, then another picture that you have of Jesus Christ is the crucifix. You have a, a dead skinny body with two or three drops of blood, white skin, very, very white, and long hair, skinny, and then he's just hanging there, like uh, uh, frail, died, dead, cannot really do a lot for you because he's so, so weak, you know, so skinny and all of this, and all this. So these are pictures, unfortunately, that stick to our minds. He says, Jesus is either on the cross or he's a baby. And here, Jesus Christ, after he returned to the highest place of honor, to the right hand of the Father, and his glorious and eternal state, wants his church to see what he is like. Because when he came on earth, he came as a human being. He lowered himself below the angels, of his, below the glory that he used to have. And the angels, and he let go of all of his essence and eternity. And he came as a man in pure humility. That's the Jesus that we have seen on earth. He accomplished his mission as a man. He was faithful to God. He learned obedience through sufferings. And he gave his life. He took our place as a substitute for men. And we are saved because of that. But that's not Jesus. That's not the Jesus that is eternal. That is the Jesus, the shape that he took in order to be our, become a substitute and pay the ransom of our sin. But the eternal Jesus that existed before the world was formed and that returned to his glory when we read in the book of John that he is returning to the Father, to his glory, this is more like it. This is more like it. And we will see many other descriptions of Jesus Christ, what he has done and his works of power in the book of Revelation. Jesus wants you to change your concept and your understanding of him. 
and to see him as he is in control so that you are not the, the, the most important Tryon fans and by yourself and independent. You are one of seven stars in his hand. What's the power? Where's the power? Where's the source of everything? It's in his hand. He is the one who rule and reign, the Alpha and the Omega, the Lamb that was slain and came back to life and reigns for eternity. And He is among His church. So He's not distant, He's not separated of, He is very much in contact with, and He knows exactly what the church is because He is there. It's like a behind the scene. It's like looking with x-rays and seeing on the other side of this world. This is a revelation, a vision, a disclosing of something that we are, in, in our human form, we are blinded of. We cannot see that with our eyes. So Jesus Christ gave this vision to us so that we see beyond this world and understand and get hope and get strong in the promises of God and can do more because our faith is so revived when you when you when you when you relate to a God that is almighty remember last time uh, I was talking about the, the word almighty he has his hands of power and everything that's, that's Jesus. So he's not the baby Jesus. He's not the dying body on the cross. He is the ruler, the alpha, the omega. The first and the last. Okay? So that is the picture. You need to put that in your mind. This is Jesus to you today. And he wants you to know him then this way. He wants you to see him. And put that truth into your heart. To sustain your faith. You are not alone. You know, after a time, you know, sometimes if you lose a, a, a loved one, on, uh, when it's fresh, when it just happened, you, your heart broken, you know, like you, you uh, or, or, or sometimes uh, for parents in, in Hong Kong who have children who will graduate high school and they are going to uh, England or Canada, USA, or whatever country to study. I remember when my, my, our, our son left home, the first one, when he, he, he returned to Canada. We were at the airport and we just cried and cried and cried and cried all together. We were all the children, we were all together hugging, hugging and crying. Because we, we, that time we realized there's a, a separation that will, be, that will be long. But you know, after time, you, your heart you know, and you forget this strong emotion and life goes on. It's the same thing. Jesus returned. You read in the gospel, you know, toward each of the gospel, there are some, especially in Luke, Mark, and Matthew, there are some application. And Jesus uh, gives a story that he is like the, the, the master, the ruler of the vineyard, and he goes away. And then he sent his servant to collect, you know, and they kill the servant, and then at one point he says, okay, I will send my son, you know. So that's a picture of going away and coming back to uh, own what belongs to you. Uh, the, the talents is the same thing. Like you have many, many pictures, and it says like uh, uh, the manager who has been given the task to manage and give food to the servants and everything, it's better to be ready when the master has come back. So, you, you have all of these pictures. So, so Jesus he has been away, he's going away, and he wants each generation of the church to know that he is not away. That he is very, very much present and very, very much connected with our life today. From generation to generation, this was written a long time ago, almost 2,000 years ago. And this same Jesus is as fresh, as involved, as concerned, as the one 2,000 years ago in that generation. Architecture changed, fashion changed, a lot of things changed, the means of transportation changed, but this Jesus is still there. And you will see him one day. Amen? Amen. So that's the Jesus that gives us this revelation, the book of uh, Revelation, and he speaks to us and he wants you to understand that. So it's important that you understand that. So don't be afraid of the book of Revelation. You know, he says there's a blessing for that. Okay. We continue the next slide. I think just quickly. Each, you will notice that each message to each church begins with some aspect of 
a vision that Jesus Christ used to portray himself. Let's look quickly and then we will, we will review that later on. To the church of Ephesians, the one who holds the seven star in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. To the church in Smyrna, the one who is the first and the last who died and came to life again. To the church in Pergamum, the words of him was the sharp double-edged sword. To the church in Thyatira, the words of the Son of God whose eyes are blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Why is he doing that? Why is he introducing himself to each church in a different and unique and particular way? There's a purpose. He's not just doing it like this, uh, just, just by coincidence. The church in Sardis, the words of him who owes the seven spirits of God and the seven star. Church in Philadelphia, the one who is holy and true, who holds the key of David, what he opens, no one can shut. In the church of Laodicea, the words of the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the ruler of God's creation. Each introduction to each church has a special uh, uh, message, uh, a special uh, aspect of, of Jesus Christ, and each one reveal a character of Jesus Christ, uh, something about his nature, and something about the city, the context, where they are, the problems that they face, and what they need. The, that image of Jesus Christ is not by coincidence. It, it, it reveals an aspect of Jesus Christ that relates to that very particular church uh, context, place, and needs. All right? Understand that? So let's move on. And I want to look this morning, but I think we will not have time, to three of these seven churches and learn about what makes a church a great church or a dying church and we we'll learn from the Lord's vision himself. So let's start with Smyrna, the persecuted church or the faithful and devoted church. Revelation chapter 2 verse 8 to 11. We'll read the verse 8 and 9 to begin with. Uh, we already read the special uh, identification of Jesus Christ, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulations and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not by the synagogue of Satan. Okay. The assembly of Smyrna was persecuted. That is a persecuted church, which explains why the Lord, and there's a reason why the Lord identified himself in this way, the Lord emphasized his death and then his resurrection to a church that faced death all along. A church that could be killed tomorrow. A, a church that could be imprisoned and mar be, be treated, martyred. And think. Jesus says, I was dead, but I am risen from the dead. So he's bringing, and he, he also used uh, the, the, the beautiful picture, I came back to life. And the first and the last. The first and the last is an attestation, a confirmation of eternity. Jesus Christ was before the world. The world was created by him. And he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he is going to rule for eternity. He has no beginning. He has no end. He is the first. He has the end. So he attests to you and me, again, because he attests so many times, to the resurrection of the dead. To the fact that there is eternity. That human being, the soul of man and the spirit of man, is to be eternal. Your body might go to the ground if you are not taken in the rapture, but your soul and your spirit is going to live on. You are eternal. You have been created eternal. That's why to prepare our eternity is the most uh, important things. Because our eternity has a possibility of two destinations. Hell or heaven. Away from God or with God. To be in the light or to be in the darkness. To be in joy and peace with no more tears. Or to be in crying, gnashing teeth in an horrible place of torment. So th this is our future. This, this is our future. We have a, a crossroad. We have choice. We go this way or we go this way. We trust the Lord or we don't trust the Lord. We live for Him or we don't live for Him. So these churches were living their life. They were struggling the same thing as us. 
with work, with money, with children, with society, with government, paying taxes, and whatever happened to every churches in the world. You know, there are churches who are just surviving. This is, their countries have no freedom. They have no freedom for, for anything. They can be arrested unfairly, you know. Uh, they, can, they will not get a good job, you know. This is existing again today. So the message of Revelation never grow old. And it can address to, to, to any churches, a, any church anywhere. So they were persecuted with their faith. So that's why the Lord emphasized his death and his resurrection and his opening message. I know your tribulation and I know of your poverty. Smyrna was an important center in the Roman Empire. And it was a very important city uh, about the imperial cult to the emperor. You, for those of you who saw the movie, The Apocalypse of John, uh, just a few weeks ago in the afternoon, you, you saw the Emperor Domitian proclaiming himself to be God. This is, this is real history. This is not making up or whatever in a movie. This real history and the Caesar, the, the following, the, the, the emperors that followed, that they were all Caesars, but with different names, they Many of them, they, they were God to their own eyes, and they forced the, the, uh, the people to bow before him, to burn incense, to, to have uh, libations of water and blood and all of this. It was an horrible time for Christians. Jews were most of the time persecuted and Christians were persecuted. But sometimes uh, Jews were not because they, they succeeded to make friends with the government and they attacked together, they betrayed the, the Christians and they attacked the children. And that's exactly what happened to this church in Smyrna. It says, from both Jews and Gentiles, the Christian in Smyrna received slander and suffering. It says, and the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but they are a synagogue of Satan. So I'm not sure exactly, exactly what it means. But we know that whoever were meeting in this synagogue were not good people. Because they were uh, contributing or adding up trouble to the church of Jesus Christ and proclaiming that they were God's holy people. But no, Jesus, God, God says, oh, I'm sorry, I don't identify with them. You see here, there's a difference. Jesus identifies with the church and he does the opposite with the synagogue. I don't identify, this is, this is not my nature. I don't like what they do. I don't approve. They are from Satan. They are not from me. But and that synagogue, a synagogue is a place of religion. It's, it's a place of worship. It's a place where we read the text from the Holy Scriptures. That's what is happening in that building. But what they are doing and with what they are reading is from Satan. Their life and whatever they are doing without going into the details. But to the church, he says, I know your poverty, but in my eyes, you are rich. So that is so uh, encouraging, all this. And because uh, the, the, the Christian refused to acknowledge Caesar as Lord and to uh, offer sacrifice and things like that, they were excluded from any uh, layers of society. No job, that means uh, poverty and extreme poverty. When it says, I know you are poor, the word used there, it's really, really poor. It's not only just poor, it's really, really poor. So Jesus says, I know your tribulation, but you are rich. And it is a contrast with the Laodicean church that we will see uh, later. It's a shocking statement that contradicts many popular uh, uh, opinions. If you go to a new place, if you move from Singapore or from Canada or the US, Australia, you come to Hong Kong, you look for a church, what will you be looking for? You go to uh, the newspaper, you go online, you type on the Google uh, churches in Hong Kong, you go through the list, you look at the photos, you look, you like it, you go. If you don't like, what, you don't go, you know, like something like that. You look a little bit at the details, whatever it says. If it is seemingly well presented, you know, popular, looks, looks kind of cool or whatever, then you will choose uh, this, this church. Maybe we should ask people who are visiting us today uh, why, why they came here uh, today. <laughs> and then they will tell us. So, here is a church. Nobody would want to go there. And so the church in Smyrna, who wants to go to that church? You want to go to that church and be persecuted? Join a group of 
people in trouble uh, and lose your job because you identify with them and you know like who wants to do this nobody wants to do that nevertheless Jesus Christ the Lord of all says you are rich wow that is like contradicting the, our, our methods or, or whatever we, we, we choose about something. Okay, think about it because it's important. Next time you move somewhere, you want to go to a church. You know, in, in Hong Kong here, uh, I remember some of the sisters, they stopped coming to Lighthouse today and they went to another church because they could save on the transport. Okay, because they could say, save maybe uh, 15 Hong Kong dollars or 8 Hong Kong dollars one way, another way. So, because they want to save money, so they would went to another church. Whether the church is good or not, it's just uh, saving money. So, pe people, people can choose a church for whatever reason, because it's trendy, it's a popular church, it's the biggest church in town. So, maybe you will ask, uh, you will go online, Google the place, says, okay, how many members in the church? You see it's a very big, oh, that must be the big one, it's the good one. Okay, we, we, we do that, you know. But, you know, when, after the typhoon Yolanda and the Philippines, I, I saw on Facebook some pictures with uh, Pastor Aligos, and uh, there were people, right after the typhoon, they were worshipping water up almost to their knees. They were in the church building, and they had water still, you know, and they had no roof. But they were, you know, all smile and worshiping the Lord. They were having a, a full, a full service. They decide that they were just going to celebrate the Lord. What a beautiful picture uh, it is, you know. Uh, and they were not like, uh, you know, looking sad or defeated or whatever. They were alive. Jesus was there, crowned in heaven, and they were singing praise with, you know, flip flop in the water and uh, no roof. You know, and everything. I look at uh, Sister Rena. Rena Lynn was telling uh, Pastor Jennifer uh, this week, you know, she has a little money. And she has people who help her to go to the, the church, uh, to the school and minister. And she likes to, uh, because everybody's poor, so she likes to pay their transportation. Like it's a, and offer some food. So you heard Pastor Jennifer says, they have stopped the constructions because she ran out of money. So she told the, the people, I'm sorry, this month I don't have money. So, you know, you think about it. You are serving the Lord, but you are in a place where you don't have money. And if you know what she eats and what is her budget for food, you will not believe it. You know, would not believe it. When we go to the Philippines, for us, we budget about 400 pesos one day, four to five hundred pesos a day, okay? And I think she lived with three hundred pesos for the month, two hundred? Per week, two hundred per week. And we live for five hundred a day, okay? <laughs> So that uh, teach you the, the, the difference in uh, using money. And she has no money, so, but she is serving the Lord. You think that the Lord Jesus can see I, 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 you are rich to her? Yes? Yeah, I think so. I think so. So uh, we, have, we have something to learn. In that church, there is no words of accusation. If you look at the text here, there is no what I have against you. There is no mention. No words of accusation into this uh, congregation. They have been despised by men, but they are praised by Jesus himself. And you know, one thing that is so comforting to me when I look at that, he gives them, uh, like these people can be killed any times. Do not fear, what? It's, it doesn't say do not fear if ever sometime in the future you will encounter some difficult times. No, it is a fact that is certain they are going to suffer. It's not if ever it happens. Do not fear what you are about. Very soon it's coming, you are going to have big trouble with government and everything. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold the devil. And what it tells you here, it's so comforting because you go behind the scene of that church, what's happening there, and you see the devil is behind all of that. The devil is mentioned two times at the synagogue of Satan, so he's at work there, and the devil is about 
to put people in prison. I didn't know the, 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 the devil can dress as a policeman or soldiers, you know? Actually, these are people who will put them in prison. But Jesus, with his fiery eyes, doesn't see the people doing that, but he sees the source of evil behind this wave of persecution, you see? And we need to rediscover uh, a spiritual eyesight to, to what is happening. Jesus says, don't fear, because I know exactly the, the circumstances of your life. I know behind the scene. Um, I, I see. Jesus assured them that he knows the devil's plan. Does the devil has plan? against you? Yes. yes, he does. Do you know them? No. Does Jesus know the plans of the devil against you? Yes, yes. You know, when we talk about, and Jesus is saying, he's, uh, he's in complete, if you look at this sentence, Jesus is in complete uh, control of the situation. He knows exactly what's coming. He knows exactly how long it will be, 10 days, whatever it is, days or a short period of time. He knows who's behind, but he knows exactly what's going to happen. But don't, don't be afraid. It's not going to be long. After that, it will be behind you. Things will change. Okay? I'm with you. I know what that. Don't be afraid. It's comforting. It's reassuring for each one of you that if you ever going to go through an horrible time, you feel that you are under the attack of the enemy, Jesus knows that. He knows exactly. He knows the devil. He knows the plan of the devil against you. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. You know, when we talk about the devil, there are two extreme view usually in the church. Some people, they see the devil everywhere. They are under, always under uh, the attack of the enemy. The uh, uh, enemy is in everything. Every day of their life, the enemy is against them. And the other group is that they live like if the devil doesn't exist. So, but Jesus knows exactly when the devil is, uh, you know, the source of evil in your life and when he is not. So you have nothing to fear because you are always under Jesus. Remember? The hands and the seven stars. I know. I know exactly what's happening. And I know the, 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 the time that it will be. So many of the believers there would be put in prison. They would be accused to be traitors against the emperor. They would go to prison. Yet their tribulation would only last ten days. Jesus just told them that. Wow, that's wonderful to know how much Jesus knows us. So we don't look at churches as Jesus does these people who choose a trendy church because of the music because it's cool you know they don't know what they are doing exactly there are people we call it church hoppers instead of grasshoppers they just they, they will never they, they will never grow because they just follow what is trendy the speaker is here this conference there so thing they put their soul they put their faith into the hands of dangerous people. Many of them are in the business of money. Many of them are of other motives. We don't know people's motives. So if you want to be safe and security, stay into your local church, you know, and examine your pastor. If you think they are not godly, then move to another place. But if you think that they are godly, then stay there because you, you, you are the good place. You, you, you know what's happening. But Jesus knows, Jesus knows the, the church. Jesus knows the church. And because these people, they trusted in Jesus, they are called overcomers in the race of faith. It was not easy to live that Christian life in Smyrna. It was very difficult, but they were overcomers. And as overcomers, they had nothing to fear. They did not fear. Whatever is going to happen in our life, I'm not going to go back. I'm not going to abandon. I'm not going to become bitter and jealous and envious. I'm not going to become an angry person uh, or, 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 or compromise and cheat and lie. Or you know, I'm going to continue to live for Jesus. And this is what they do. And look at uh, this text. There is a crown of life. The context of this church situation is death, suffering. Jesus uh, it identified himself with them as the one who was dead. He experienced death and he overcame death. 
and now he is the uh, beginning and the end and he is promising them just go on persevere don't be afraid because at the end I'm going to give you the crown of life your name is going to be in the book of life there is a life for you not death you may face death you may die but when you walk with the Lord of glory you you are going to end up in eternity he is the one who experienced that is the Alpha and Omega the eternal God no matter how what experience you know uh, we are going to open the church to a group in Hong Kong called Christian Solidarity Worldwide. Like at this moment, we are, it, it's a privilege at, at this point, through the contacts, through the years. Thursday night, we have the Pakistani church meeting in 303. For now, a long time, almost two years, something like this. Uh, on Sunday afternoon in 303, the ICA Indian Church uh, that just established a new group. They are meeting in the hotel next to us. So they are using 303 for their Sunday school program. And uh, soon on Friday night, uh, once a month, Christian Solidarity Worldwide will be meeting here in the church. And we would want to invite you to participate if you can. What they are doing, they pray for the persecuted church. They pray for the suffering church, for our brothers. And each month they bring usually uh, two, uh, two different situations in different countries, what people have been, uh, the situation is and everything. And then they pray for, for them. So we are very honored to, to be able to start participating into this one. Even if they were martyred, the people in Smyrna, they would be going to glory and receive a crown of life. They would never face the awful judgment of the second death. They will not be hurt by the second death. There is a death that they would maybe uh, meet through the political uh, oppressions and persecutions, but not the second death. The second death is the lake of fire. They are not going to be afraid of that. They are not going to, to, to face or to experience that, the lake of fire. It costs to be a dedicated Christian. Even if you are not in a situation like uh, Smyrna, it will cost you in some places more than other. And as we approach the end times and the coming of the Lord, pressures of all sorts will be multiplied. And as, as you look at the media and as you look everywhere in modern countries especially, you see that the popularity of Christianity is just like it's being despised and everything. You, you see it in the newspaper, you know. Uh, we were listening, Pastor Jennifer and I, this week to uh, uh, a, a preacher. She's a Latino American uh, lady and she just talks about the end times and she, she talks very, very well. She's very lively, she's funny, but she's, and she takes uh, headlines happening now and she just put it in the context of the Lord's coming and she's she's fiery for God and she's filled with the Holy Spirit and she's, she's very funny and uh, so she, she was talking about uh, uh, this kind of, of things and the end times when the pressure and the persecution will will come and uh, like an example that she gave a judge in the US um, gave the verdict that uh, practicing uh, yoga in schools is okay because he says it is exercise and it is now part of our American culture. It doesn't have a religious foundation. So that's what the judge is, 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 is says. Okay, yeah, we can have. You cannot pray in the U.S. anymore in school. You cannot, uh, you know, do any form of religion in school. But you can practice yoga with primary school children. This is okay. Uh, and it is a, a verdict. I mean, this is this is passed already. You know. So anyway, that's just one uh, little, little thing. You know about uh, homosexuality, tolerance, and if you have an opinion, you are homophobe. If you, if you think this is not right, if you say anything 
negative, or even if you quote the Bible about uh, homosexuality, you are called an homophobe, an enemy of humanity. You, you are a hater. That's, that's what it is. So Christianity are being given that look, that picture all over the world. This is where we're going. So your life is not going to be easier. If you want to be an overcomer and uh, share the love of Jesus and be a faithful witness, you will eventually pay a price for your faith. You, you will. There's no question about that. Just like he says here, do not fear what you are about to if you live fully for Christ, there will be a about to in your life. You, you, will, you will pay a cost. You want to be a Christian? Be a Christian. Don't be a Christian because it's the cool thing to do. Because it's, not going, it's going to be less and less cool <laughs> as we move toward the Lord's coming. It's not going to be cool to be a Christian. You will have to stand. You know when people say, oh, religion is like um, a crutch because the people are so weak they cannot stand on their own. I mean... To be a Christian in this society, you have to stand on your two feet. It's much, much easier to just do like the others. Just uh, despise Christianity, say something bad or whatever, just uh, live your life in sin or whatever. This is, this is easy. This is following the current. Have you ever been in a rushing uh, rivers, going down a mountain and trying to walk the opposite way? This is your future as a Christian. You want to live the Christian life, you will go against the current. And the current is going to go much, much, uh, it going to be much more dangerous. That's the price. You are going to, uh, about to suffer. You want to live for Jesus? It doesn't matter. If you have a lot of money, not a lot of money, how fancy the church is. But does Jesus look at this church and can say, you are rich? If Jesus looks at your Christian life, does he see that you are rich? Or, uh, we are not going to start another one because we don't have time. But the Laodicean people, they says, we have need of nothing, we are rich. And Jesus says, you are not rich. So it's up to you to decide what kind of riches you want to build. What, what, if you look ahead to the glory that is going to come because you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you want to make him happy and you want to hear at the end, well done, good and faithful servant, and say, you are rich. Regardless of whatever your circumstances are, you are rich in my eyes. Amen? Amen. Let us stand this morning. Hallelujah. Praise God.